So good afternoon to all of you guys. It's nighttime here in Israel, and uh, hopefully it's going to be all quiet. It should be. Uh, so my name is Alon Orlev. I'm a skull based and cerebrovascular neurosurgeon. I'm very th I'm thankful for the opportunity. And um, I'm going to talk about some updates on endoscopic skull base surgery. I'm going to run through a couple of topics. Um, uh, the one disclosure I have is um, that the, we're going to talk about a transorbital cadaveric study that we did this past summer at uh, SSF, and we did it with uh, the great help of uh, from Carl Storks that um, that supported us, and we'll discuss that a bit later. We're going to start off, though, by talking about endonasal resection of secreting adenomas. So as we know, secreting adenomas, uh, pituitary adenomas, they are various treatment options, uh, medical treatment. It's commonly first line in some prolactinomas, second line for other tumors. Radio surgery, we know it's it achieves suboptimal control of hormonal hypersecretion. And surgical treatment, it's commonly first line with varying results, and we'll talk about that quite a bit. So there are some recent studies that came out that show that a tumor is commonly involved in uh, structures that are adjacent to the tumor, as expected in a way. And I think that has uh, slowly caused some sort of a paradigm shift and it's driven by surgical knowledge and experience and by technology. We can see much better in there currently than we could in the past. And I think we're moving on from targeted microadenoma resection as we have in the past to a sort of an oncologic approach to a super maximal exploration of the cella. And I'm going to show some examples of that. So I'm going to um, step a little bit sideways and talk about, so it's all about a NOSP adenoma grading. And we know that um, the NOSP grade, this is from a great paper from a year and a half ago from the Stanford group. Um, but uh, they they actually looked at the NOSP grading, grade zero to four, which, uh, which is uh, the paracellar involvement or the cavernous sinus involvement. And they kind of looked at um, uh, the the involvement of um, the medial cavernous sinus and they and we know from previously that the medial cavernous sinus is involved. Obviously, the involvement increases uh, with the grade um, with the NOS grading, but they've actually shown that it's a lot more frequent than we had originally thought. So, um, so that's the NOS grading, and it drives the surgical indications for secreting adenoma. Um, which ones do we take, and how do we approach them? And recently in prolactinomas, there's a, there are new guidelines that actually came out um, that talk about um, uh, surgical resection of grade zero and one um, prolactinomas as first line treatment in specialized centers and not um, cabergulin, which it has been so far the treatment uh, choice. I don't, I'm not sure it's still, it has still gained a lot of popularity because most endocrinologists still treat with medication first, but it is first line according to um to some guidelines. Um, so I'm going to show you now um, a patient, a 52 year old female with Cushing's disease. She underwent microscopic resection of her ACTH producing microadenoma in 2011, 12 years ago, and had a remission of over a decade. She had medical and radiographic recurrence, and she was planned for repeat surgery with removal of the medial cavernous sinus and lateral pituitary gland. I'm going to show this now because the idea, what I want to show you is that we're doing bigger surgeries. So um, the video should start. Um, this was done uh, quite recently. So this is the recurrent adenoma. It's on the right side of the pituitary here. I hope you see it okay, but this is, uh, it's a little oversaturated, uh, but we're seeing here after I opened everything, we're looking at the tumor itself. It's on the right side of the cella. And we start off as we always have by resecting the tumor. And now I'm actually dissecting the tumor from the cavernous sinus wall. And you see there's more tumor coming out and we're braver than we were in the past. And we're clearing off the cavernous sinus wall as the medial cavernous sinus wall, as you can see here. Next, what this is next, what we do, which we haven't mostly in the past, is I'm actually resecting the lateral gland, the gland that seemed normal. I'm, I'm taking pieces of the lateral gland that was adjacent to the tumor. I see some more tumor there. And then I'm transposing the gland superiorly in order to reach behind it and get some more tumor because I, it seems like there's some more tumor back there. And lastly, and this is, I guess, something that is quite newish, is that uh, I'm here resecting um, the medial cavernous sinus wall. And again, this is something that's been described in various papers uh, that when the, when the tumor is adhering to the cavernous sinus wall, 
um, it is often involved. And, and we look at these uh, secreting tumors as binary, right? We either take it all out and we cure the patient or we leave some behind and we did nothing or almost nothing. So as you can see, I'm dissecting the medial cavernous sinus wall, making sure I don't have any structures, any of the cavernous sinus structures, may, mainly, of course, the ICA. I want to make sure that the, nothing is adherent. And then after doing the dissection, I'm actually resecting the wall. And this is something that I think uh, we were less inclined to do in the past and we're able to do now. This is the cavernous sinus content, which we can see um, afterwards. POD1 cortisol was low. POD2 was already really Addisonian. No DI, no CSF leak. She was discharged on POD3. And this is just one uh, recent example. And um, and, I'll and I'll show you another one. This is a growth hormone secreting macroadenoma. This is a 55-year-old male with acromegaly from an grade 3-4 producing pituitary macro. He started off on uh, medical treatment uh, with little improvement, and then he was referred by his endocrinologist for tumor debulking. He was planned, I planned for a partial resection and to take some of the cavernous sinus content as well. Not, I did not think I'll get all of it. I did not plan to. Um, and But we do know that with uh, growth hormone secreting tumors, when they're large, if we resect part, if we um, do some major debulking, then afterwards with medical treatment, they can often get control. So that's why we wanted to go for this uh, for this uh, tumor resection. As you can see, this was a little bit of a difficult involvement because I hope you see my mouse uh, on this right side. You can see that the tumor goes in be uh, inside through the medial cavernous sinus wall and actually wraps around the uh, the inside of the anterior genu. On the left side, <clears throat> what you can see on the sagittal image, you can see that there's it seems like there's also some tumor in front of the ICA, meaning in, in, the very, in, in the very ventral portions of the cavernous sinus, which I was hoping to get some of that as well, um, as we'll see next. Not a, not a complete video. Again, it's a little oversaturated, but the, I put some labels with just some pictures. Tumor invaded the bone. You see tuberculum, you see cella, you see optic canal and ICA. The first thing, thing I do is I open the lateral recess of the sphenoid and access the anterior wall of the cavernous sinus. I remove the bone from the anterior ca cavernous sinus wall or the lateral recess, and then I resect tumor from anterior to the uh, ICA. Next, I uh, in the cavernous sinus. Next, I work around in the cella and, and take tumor from all around the different sections of uh, the cella region, which I think this is what we've always been doing. And... Uh, and now I'm on the left side where the tumor invaded. And after that, you see, I'm actually resecting from the medial cavernous sinus while I'm retracting the ICA. Look, this is the ICA cavernous segment. Then you see the anterior genu, and you can see that the inside of it, or like the, the medial, the, the behind the anterior genu, I, we cleared up some tumor. This is what we have left. And uh, and we actually did manage to get complete resection on this, uh, on this patient. Um, we did... Uh, I think better than what we hoped for. The POD cortisol went down below too, which is a good sign of um, of uh, remission. He was discharged on POD four, and his pathology was uh, pitnet uh, densely granulated. Um, so just to summarize, I think this goes. Uh, what I wanted to show is that our enhanced anatomic knowledge, surgical experience, and technology allow us to do. A, a super maximal resection of these secreting pituitary tumors. I think there are new cure rate standards that are slowly being reported by centers of excellence. This paper that I mentioned from Stanford, in this paper, they reported a 92% um, cure rate on patients with, with the secreting tumors. That is above and beyond what we've known in the past. We've seen in previous papers, you know, in previous case series, we, we've seen 60s and 70s, maybe low, <clears throat> maybe 80 percent. Um, but getting into the 90s, I think, happens by treating these uh, as um, as more invasive or super looking at these uh, for a super maximal resection. And lastly, I invite all our medical colleagues and our endocrinologists to 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 test us to, because I think we can do better surgery than we did in the past. So, so that's a, that's one topic I wanted to talk about. And now we're going to switch gears completely and talk about it, something else, something I've touched about in the past in the talk we've done here. And I'm going to expand on that a little bit. 
So the transorbital neuroendoscopic surgery, it's a contemporary endoscopic surgical approach to access lesions beyond the reach of the endonasal corridors. And I'll show that in a second. We use known eyelid incisions and intraorbital extraconal surgical approaches to the skull base. Um, it's team surgery, as we do with the endonasal surgery. Here we often get the assistance of either oculoplastic or facial plastic surgeons, um, depending on the team you have, you have that you build. Um, the neuroendoscope and the entire surgical instruments that we use for the endoscopic endonasal, um, we use it also for the transorbital. It's very similar. And there are several published case series on resection of sphenoorbital meningioma, cavernous sinus lesions, trigeminal schwannomas, other tumors. These are all things that can be accessed uh, through this approach. And again, there are some case series from different centers in the States and also um, in other countries, of course, in, in Italy, in Korea. Um, this is a great, this is a nice uh, picture from a paper in 2020 by uh, by the an Italian group that, that kind of shows the difference between what you can get through the nose and what you can get through the eye. And, and this is a very important picture, that a very important um, image that I want to uh, discuss because as you can see, when you go through the nose, which is, which is the endonasal corridor, which is the inferior picture over here, um, you you can transpose the, the paraclival carotid laterally a little, little bit. Obviously, um, work, work in this corridor and get to the anterior, to the anterior inferior region in the petrous, um, the anterior uh, petrous ridge, but just a little bit of it. If you want to work, what really limits you is the carotid partially, but the gazerian ganglion and the, and the trigeminal divisions limit you quite a bit. And you can work in windows in between or go through a lateral um La, la, complete lateral trajectory through the maxillary sinus and all that has been published. But the transorbital approach that you can see up here can actually take you to a completely different area, completely lateral to where you were before and having the gazerian ganglion and the, and the divisions of a, the trigeminal being the, your medial border and actually working lateral to all those. And again, in this, in this image, in this um, drawing, it looks better than or easier than it, it actually is. But I think we've done some we've done something similar, and I'll show that soon. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just show one clinical example, a short one. Um, this is a seventy three year old female that came in with proptosis, double vision, marked visual acuity decline from a sphenoorbital and plaque meningioma involving the op the optic canal. And we planned her for a tones decompression of the lateral orbital wall and wall and optic canal with temporal dural resection, not a complete resection. We did not need that. Um, here. Um, so this was her tumor. Um, as you can see, she has another Fouts tumor, but this is the tumor that we're dealing with. And you can see how this end plaque meningioma really mostly involving the bone that um, and uh, is actually has compressed the optic nerve to the point that we can't see its course. And that has caused her, her visual decline. And you can also see from this MRI, her proptosis. So that's what she's been suffering from. And, and a lot of pain, as you can assume. Um, I just want. I just have here uh, to show you. Um, I just want. I didn't want to overload with many surgical videos, but what we see here is the pre-op and the post-op um, uh, picture, 3D picture of her CT scan. So you can see how much bone we drilled off. This is uh, for what. First of all, you can see that we took just a bit of the lateral rim and reattached it. Then we drilled out the entire. Uh, through the transorbital uh, approach, the entire lateral wall of, wall of the orbit opened the superior and the inferior orbital fissure, decompressed the optic nerve, and that's what we went. That's what we came for, really. Um, so her neuroophthalmology exam uh, a month after, which she, she had marked visual acuity improvement, and she had improvement in double vision as her eye came back, came back in. Um, she does suffer. Now she's about two months out. She's still suffering from her trigeminal V1 numbness and tingling. That's been bothering, and we've been talking about some medical treatment for that. And she does have a residual tumor that's planned for observation, almost as planned. She was kind enough to let me take some pictures of her uh, and actually show them show here. Um, so, so this is in the OR. You can see this is the incision. It's a four centimeter incision that we do in the eyelid and, um, and take it a little bit lateral to the lateral canthus. POD3, you see their entire eye is uh, quite inflamed. And it's not three months, it's more like two months post-op that I've seen her recently. And as you can see, she looks great. Uh, and that is thanks to uh, my partner, having a great oculoplastic partner that um, that uh, that does these uh, incisions and then and then closes it up, closes it, 
uh, the, sir, the incision up so nicely. She just looks great. Um, so um, now I'm going to talk about one more topic in this uh, same realm. Um, we, and that's what we've actually developed, um, um, Dr. Litvak and myself, uh, and, and we've tested it, as I've mentioned earlier, with the help of uh, the group, uh, the people from, uh, from Stortz. We've, we've been looking into an extended transorbital neuroendoscopic uh, approach. So it was a cadaveric study that was aimed to expand the surgical field of view and access to the anterior petrous ridge and posterior fossa via this minimally invasive transorbital approach. What we did differently or expanded on, and that's why we called it an extended approach, is we actually completely removed the superior and lateral orbital rims uh, in one piece, as I'll show you. And that allows a better, um, a, a better field of view and also better manipulation of the surgical instruments uh, through this corridor. Door. It offers an unobstructed uh, ventral to dorsal view of the anterior petrous ridge. And it's, in my, in my opinion, after we show uh, that it works, it's designed to replace the traditional subtemporal and pretemporal approaches. So just, um, so um, as we know, there's a subtemporal or the Kawase approach that's been described in the mid 80s. There's the pretemporal approach in which we, um, uh, which is the orange here, where uh, we kind of move, uh, uh, which we um, kind of retract the temporal lobe uh, um, uh, posteriorly and laterally. And then there's the endonasal approach, which we've discussed, and we talked about its limitations. And this is a transorbital approach, which kind of is in between and, uh, and is a great avenue, I think, to the anterior petrous ridge. Um, this is what we do in the E-tones. The, these are the cuts. And as you can see in the top right um, uh, corner, this the picture, you can see the difference between making just removing the lateral orbital rim, which is what we've done in the previous patient that I showed the picture of, to removing the entire superior and lateral um, uh, orbital rims in one piece, as you can see here. It's a big piece of bone that we remove and obviously reattach at the end for cosmetic reasons. So this is a cada this is a, the cadaver study that we've done um, this, uh, um, this past summer at SSF. And here we, you see I'm, uh, we're doing just a skin incision and we're marking these cuts. Um, I'm making an initial burr hole in, in order to protect the frontal dura and uh, and put it in placing our, uh, and and then only then I make these cuts. You can use an oscillating saw, which is what I use on the cadavers. You can also use a bone scalpel, which I feel more more comfortable using in the OR because it's less vibra vibrating. But, uh, but you make these uh, cuts, which we've uh, described in a paper that we're writing this up in order to completely remove this in one piece. And, um, and you see, I now I break it off with uh, a chisel and the entire piece comes off as one, and that would be reattached at the end. And that leaves me with a great view um, of the lateral orbit. We start drilling that, and now I'm showing once we place the endoscope in there, and we can see already temporal dura, and we can see that, I'm, that using the endoscope we're removing here in the endoscopic instruments. We're seeing the temporal dura, and we open the superior and inferior orbital fissures. Now I'm doing some dissection, the sub-temporal dissection in the medial temporal um, uh, fossa, and and I'm slowly um, and I'm slowly retracting the temporal lobe, and then what I get to is the is the trigeminal nerve, right? The trigeminal divisions V3 we see here initially, and we continue you dissecting an interdural plane um, in uh, in this injected cadaver between the trigeminal divisions and the cavernous sinus, which is medial to us, and the temporal dura, which is lateral, and we keep going back until we get to the gazerian ganglion. So we get to the gazerian ganglion, then we see the anterior petrous ridge, which is what I'm drilling now. And once we once we go through that, here there's the last picture that you can see. I'm putting the endoscope, and we can see here the trigeminal divisions take us to the gazerian ganglion, and all the way through. You can put this endoscope with a straight zero endoscope. You can put it all the way through into the opening that uh, that uh, we made, and you can see here um, uh, uh, seven and eight the, the uh, the nerves, and you can really open the IAC through this uh, this approach, and you actually haven't retracted retracted much at all on the temporal lobe, and now on the eye um, because we did this large opening of uh, of the rim. Now um, this is unpublished data yet, which we're again we're working on on finalizing. So um, you see, there are really two um, the the in the picture on the left. You can see that when you approach this laterally through the subtemporal approach, you have to retract the temporal lobe, 
but your approach is a lateral to medial. And here we actually have a ventral to dorsal view, similar. As you can see here, this is one of the cadavers that we've done. Um, the Kawasa, the, the subtemporal uh, approach gives you something like this. The approach that we've done gives you something like this. The extended tones, it's um, and it's a nice um, ventral to dorsal view of, uh, of the anterior petrous ridge in, in PFOSA if you need it. So um, uh, there we go. So in summary, so uh, tones is a contemporary neuroendoscopic approach with expanding indications and uh, and there's growing experience worldwide. I think, and e tones is what we've what we've described here. It's an extension to the described tones. It enhances surgical maneuverability and and probably it enhances safety to the petrous ridge and posterior fossa. As I've mentioned. The e-tones we've described and examined in an anatomic study, and I hope to present clinical data in the future um, on this as well. Um, thank you for inviting me. These are my references. This uh, this is Tel Aviv in um, peaceful times and me surfing there, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Dr. Orlev, thank you so much. Uh, it's good to see you, my friend, and uh, just an outstanding presentation on this work of really cutting edge approaches uh, to the skull base. So thank you so much. We'll pause here and see if anybody in the audience or online has any questions for Dr. Orlev. Um, so you alluded to it, and uh, we, we do have uh, one question re regarding the use of neuromonitoring. Uh, for this type of approach. What, you had mentioned that this is still cadaveric. You had done one for that periorbital sphenoid wing meningioma. What sort of monitoring do you do for those cases? So so uh, I've done a few. The ones, um, I did not, it, it really depends where you're going. So, um, so uh, doing, doing neuromonitoring to the, uh, to the cranial nerves is, um, is a bit of a problem because you can't um, because you're retracting the globe in your um, and so you can't really put you can, uh, and you need to be able to see the eye all the time. The partner that I work with, the ocular plastic surgeon, uh, he puts the retractor on the on the eye and he also releases it every once in a while and has to look into it. So so to put um, needles in through it would be a problem. It would be it would be great if you we were able to do that when we're taking cavernous sinus lesions. Uh, which which I've done. I've I've dug into the cavernous sinus to do a biopsy, and I've actually presented that here as well. Uh, in the past, I did not have any neuromonitoring there because, again, I <clears throat> I could jeopardize the globe. But um, but I'm not sure that you can really get good neuromonitoring while still keeping the globe free in order to really inspect it while you're working, and that's required. Yeah, no, all very good points. So uh, thank you again, Alan. Uh, wish you a good evening. Thank you for joining us uh, from Tel Aviv. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. We're going to move on with our agenda. Our next.